work by a varying force is going to be the topic of this lesson in my brand new general physics playlist, which will end up covering a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now, I focus on that emphasis of algebra-based because we're going to scratch the surface on just a little bit of calculus here. Uh, and there's no way around it with work with a varying force. Now, you're still not going to have to do calculus, but I'm going to explain kind of why normally we'd be treating this with calculus, just not in this class. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. All right, so we're going to return to one of our early definitions for work here. And as long as we're dealing in one dimension where the force and the displacement were in the same direction, and we define it as the x direction for simplicity's sake, but it could be any direction, then work was just equal to force times displacement in that same direction. Okay, well, it turns out the definition for work is a little more complicated than that. So, and if you were in a calculus-based class, this is the definition you would have been given. Work is equal to the integral of f dx. Okay, well, you're not in a calculus-based class if you're watching my video in all likelihood, so, and you wouldn't be on the hook for calculus. However, this is kind of instructive to kind of explain why we're going to do what we do when we treat work with a varying force graphically. So it turns out as long as you're dealing with a constant force, and that's the only kind of problems we've dealt with up till now, uh, a constant pulls out in front of the integral, we get work equals force times the integral of dx. Well, the integral of dx is simply x. And if you're doing it from uh, an initial boundary condition of x initial to a final boundary condition of x final, then it's just delta x. And you simply end up with the result we already had of f delta x. But the assumption is, though, that this result only uh, works if the force was constant and pulled out front. And so if your force is constant, great, our working definition works but it doesn't work in this lesson where we're dealing with work with a varying force. What if your force changes uh, as the displacement changes, or as the position changes, really, rather? So, and that's what we deal with with a, a spring, right? So this is the applied force. So working on a spring, notice uh, Hooke's law says f equals negative kx, but that's the restoring force. So now I'm talking about the applied force that's gonna elongate the spring, it's f equals kx. And the force grows as the position gets further and further away from the equilibrium position. It is a varying force, it's not a constant force. And this formula for work doesn't work for that situation with a spring. So in that case, we actually have to substitute the equation in, like in this case, we'd put kx in for f. The spring constant k is still a constant, and we'd pull it in front of the integral, but we'd be taking the integral of x dx. Well, the integral of x dx is 1 half x squared, and all of a sudden the work would end up equal, equaling 1 half kx squared. That should look familiar. Yeah, that's the formula for elastic potential energy. And you'd be integrating it from your boundary conditions, x initial, x final, and what you find is that uh, work is just the negative of the change in potential energy. So, and that's why it ends up looking like the formula for potential energy with the given boundary condition. So, well, we're not going to be doing any calculus in this class. What we're going to be doing instead is treating it graphically because it turns out when you're taking an integral of a function, what you're really doing is finding the area under the curve. And so that's what we can approximate or in many cases calculate uh, for fairly straightforward graphs. And so when you're given a graph of force versus position, the area under the curve is equal to the work by definition. That's the part you need to remember. The fact that, that you know, we, we started with an integral and all that stuff, not important, but if you've got any kind of minimal background in calculus, hopefully you remember that the taking an integral means taking the area under the curve, which is why we're doing what we're doing. If, if you've got no background in calculus, just know that the area under the curve in force versus position is equal to work. So that's the key here. So if we look at the question we're gonna answer here, the question says for the graph above, or it says the graph above is, is the force versus position curve for a force applied to an uh, to elongate a spring. How much work is performed by the applied force as the spring is displaced from 2.0 meters to 5.0 meters? What that really means then, if I want the work from two meters to five meters, I need the area under the curve from two meters to five meters. I need that area right there. Well, unfortunately, that area right there is not 
the easiest thing to find, right? It's not a perfect rectangle, it's not a triangle, things of a sort. However, what we can do is a couple different things. I can see that I do have a triangle right here. That'd be one way to take it. So, and I do have a triangle right here and I could take the big triangle minus the little one, which would be the area we've got highlighted in red, that work we want from two to five meters. So that'd be one way to take it. We could also try and ballpark it. We could also cut this up into a couple different shapes. You know, we could cut this up so that we've got a rectangle here and a triangle here and things of that sort. And that could potentially work as well. So we really got, you know, any kind of normal route we've got uh, using a little bit of geometry. All right, neither one of these is gonna be perfectly easy, just so you know, but we can figure them out. So if you wanna go the rectangle route, well, these the rectangle here, so we can see that it's uh, gonna be three long on this dimension, but the question is how tall is it? Well, the question is then, well, where does this point hit right here? Well, that's gonna be based on the slope of this graph. So if you look at the slope of this graph, we're going from zero to 100. So on the fourth side, as we go from zero to five. Well, if we do rise over run, going up 100 as we go over 5, the slope is 20. That means we go up 20 every time we go over to the right 1. So over 1, up 20. Over 1, up another 20 to 40. That point right there is at 40. And at 3 meters, it would be at 60. doesn't line up perfectly with my lovely chicken scratch here, but... Uh, at 4 meters, it would correspond to 80 newtons, and at 5, it corresponds to 100. So 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 newtons on that straight line. And so in this case, we can see that our rectangle here is going to be, again, 3 by 40. So in 3 by 40, and again, that's technically 3 meters by 40 newtons, that's 120 joules worth of work. So, and then for our triangle here, so again, that's also going to be 3 uh, and in this case, by 60 now, so going from 40, let's do that said 40 up to 100, so that's 60, again, 3, but notice area of a triangle is 1 half base times height, if you might recall. And so in this case, we're going to be going uh, 3 by 60 times a half. So 3 by 60, let's write that out. So area equals 1 half base times height, so 1 half times 3 times 60. So one half of 60 is 30, three times 30 is 90, and that's 90 joules. And we add those two together and we're gonna get 210 joules. And again, that's not the only way we could have done that. Again, we could have taken just the big triangle minus this little one right here and got it that way as well. And if we look at the big triangle, again, one half base times height, would be one half five by a hundred. So, and five times a hundred is two, I'm sorry, it's 500 times a half is 250. Cool, and then we gotta subtract off the little triangle and that's two and notice it intersects at that point which was at 40 for the height. And so in this case, that would be one half two, times 40. So half of 2 is 1, so times 40 is just 40. Take the difference and 250 minus 40 would once again be 210 joules. Cool, so that's geometry and I'll leave you guys to work that out yourselves on you know the exact set of geometric shapes you want to take and stuff. And sometimes it's sufficient enough just to approximate it on like a multiple choice question. But the big thing you got to take away here is that when you're dealing with a varying force and you don't have calculus at your disposal, so a graph of force versus position is what you need. So, and it's the area under the curve that's gonna get your work. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.